Turning your Bibles to Matthew chapter 13. In the time that remains, we're going to look at this passage, another parable. You know, the older I get, the more I've noticed that my conversations have changed. What I talk about has changed. I, I notice that I'm talking more about the weather. I don't know why. I just seem to talk about the weather. I have this kind of innate desire to watch the weather channel. You know, I never did before, but I'm, I like the weather channel now. Um, food, you got to talk about food, how good food is. It's just a lot of conversation with us old people. Uh, we talk about how good food is and best, best restaurants. And then we talk about the way things used to be. That's just a, way, a thing that we talk, the way things used to be. I remember back in the day, there was this field out there. Now there's a mall. And I remember you when you were just this high, those kinds of things. The way things used to be, kind of reminiscent and sentimental. And as I prepared this week, I thought about, what Jesus was talking about in this parable and how he's going to challenge the disciples to be in the world, but not of it, how they would relate to the culture. And I thought about the world that we live in, and I thought I would never live to the day and age when I would see the world as it is now. You turn on the news and you hear about this place that seems to be upside down. And the legitimizing of immorality, the evil that can take place in this world. And you go, God, what, what is going on? Well, in this parable, Jesus is going to talk about the kingdom of heaven. And he's going to talk about it in the context of that culture. But it says something to you and me also. He's going to talk about the kingdom of heaven. He's going to talk about Christians, Christ followers, and the culture. And there are important principles for us to understand about the kingdom, both in the present sense and in the future. So here is our hope. These two things are our hope that Jesus is going to talk about in this passage, both how we should live now in the context of our day, but also what God is going to do in the future. His kingdom has come and his kingdom is coming. And that should give great hope to you and to me. So look in verse 24 of chapter 13. This has been called the parable of the wheat and tares. It's referred to in this passage as the parable of the weeds. That's what the disciples call it. Let's read what it says in verse 24. He, that's Jesus, put another parable before them saying, the kingdom of heaven may be compared to a man who sowed good seed in his field. But while his men were sleeping, his enemy came and sowed weeds among the wheat and went away. Now, um, when we're talking about weeds in this context, we're talking about a wheat-like weed. So it's weeds sown in the middle of wheat in a wheat field. And this is what it looks like. You'll see the wheat and the tares. You see the weeds are these darker ones. The wheat is the golden, beautiful yellow the weeds are the darker ones. These are the tares, the wheat and the tares. And so what would happen in that day is that if you really wanted to get your enemy, if you really wanted to ruin your neighbor, you would go to his farm and you would plant seeds of, of uh, weeds, wheat like weeds, tares in the middle of the wheat field. And it would cause all kinds of problems and it would ruin the crop. And it was common. It was so common the day that the Romans would make a law against it. So this is what would happen, kind of an environmental terrorism type of thing going on, right? So Jesus is describing this occurring, and then he goes on, verse 26, so when the plants came up and bore grain, then the weeds also appeared. In truth, when the plants were young, you could not tell them apart. You couldn't tell the wheat from the tares when they were young, but as they grew up, then they began to be noticeably different. That's the idea. Verse 27, the servants of the master of the house came and said to him, Master, did you not sow good seed in your field? How then does it have weeds? He said to them, an enemy has done this. So the servants said to him, then do you want us to go and gather them? That is the weeds. But he said, no, lest in gathering the weeds, you root up the wheat along with them. Let both grow together until the harvest. And at harvest time, I will tell the reapers. Gather the weeds first, bind them in bundles to be burned, but gather the wheat into my barn. Now, at first glance, this might not be very understandable to you and me. In this agricultural culture of the day, it was certainly more understandable. Jesus is saying the kingdom of heaven is like this. The kingdom of heaven is like this. So what is it like? Well, later on in the passage, he's going to explain the parable to us. Look down in verses 36 through 39. Here's the kingdom. Verse 36 says, Then he left the crowds and he went into the house. What house? P 
Peter's house. We're still at Peter and Andrew's house. We were there weeks ago. Jesus is telling seven parables in uh, Matthew chapter 13. So we're still in the same region. And his disciples came to him saying, explain to us the parable of the weeds in the field. And he answered, the one who sows the good seed is the son of man. So the sower, he says, is the son of man. Now this title, son of man, was Jesus' favorite self-reference. It was his favorite expression to describe himself to others. It's found all throughout the New Testament. Son of man, son of man, the son of man. It's a reference to Daniel chapter 7. This prophecy about Messiah in Daniel chapter 7 would be called the son of man. So the Jews of this day certainly understood what Jesus was talking about. He was referring to himself as the Messiah, as the Christ, the son of of man. It goes on, the field is the world. Now notice the sower sows seed in his field. It belongs to the Lord. The earth is the Lord's is the idea. And the good seed is the sons of the kingdom. I like that phrase, sons of the kingdom. Children of the kingdom, people of the kingdom, Christ followers. That's what the sower is sowing into the field. Those are the good seeds. The weeds are the sons of the evil one, and the enemy who sowed them is the devil. The harvest is the end of the age, and the reapers, or the harvesters, are angels. So what's going on here? What is Jesus describing here when he's talking about the kingdom, Christians, and culture, particularly the relationship of Christians, Christ followers, to the culture? Good seed, bad seed, that kind of thing. Well, here's what he's saying, first of all. God has placed his children throughout the earth. The sower is sowing in his field. He's doing it intentionally. He's doing it purposefully. The ideal here is that God is spreading his children throughout the earth to inhabit the earth, to be good seed, to be wheat, to produce something that is very good and beneficial for the earth. It is not by accident. God is doing this on purpose. Have you ever been lost but then ended up where you were supposed to go? Hopefully you did because you'd still be lost right now, right? Sorry. <laughs> but you've, ever, you've, been, you've been lost and then you eventually, you find your way to the, to the right place. But along the way, you know, you're thinking to yourself, okay, I'm, I'm kind of lost, but you don't want to admit it to anybody. Your spouse says to you, are, are you lost? Do you know where you're going? No, I know where I'm going. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I know. And then when you get there, <laughs> you're like, see, I knew where I was going. Yeah, but it took us an hour to get to Tomball, that kind of thing, Right? <laughs> lost, but eventually being in the right place. This is often, I think, how we feel in the world. A sense of lostness in this culture that's upside down, this this sense of darkness that is around us, the, the things that we see and we go, man, it just seems like I'm not in the place where I need to be, but we need to be reminded that we are and that God has purposefully placed us on this earth, even in the midst of the weeds, even in the midst of evil that's surrounding us, God has us here. And the million dollar question is why? Why would in this age for this time, why would God plant us here? Well, he wants us to be in the world for two primary reasons, two reasons. He said in John 17, my prayer is not that we take them out of the world, but that you protect them from what? From the evil one. They're not of this world just as I am not of this world. There's two primary reasons why God is leaving us and planting us here in this place. The first thing is so that we would change, to change us. In this context, in this place, in this world, where we have challenges and hardships, even tragedies that occur, God uses those for good. This is the promise of Romans 8.28 that John shared. That he, he uses all situations in our lives for good and he can grow us and change us and build our character. In fact, think about the change that you've had happen in your life. Likely it's been the result of pain and hardship. Some of the most dramatic changes that you've been able to make in your life are a result of hardships that you've incurred in some way. This is what is true. This world changes us and it changes us if we respond to it the right way. It changes us for the better. It makes us more Christ-like, but also he has planted us here not only so that we could be changed, but that we could change others. When Jesus left this earth, he gave a very clear mission. Go and make disciples of all nations. 
Folks, he left us here so that we can be difference makers. He left us here so that we could be influencers of others, that we could be used by God, as John explained, used by God to change the minds and the hearts of men and women across the, the earth. That's why he has us here. And so these challenges and the hardships do not necessarily oppose the kind of growth that we need and the change that he wants to see in other people. In fact, he uses these things as a way of bringing change into others. So in that context, saying, listen, I'm leaving you here so this world will change you. I'm leaving you here so that you can change others. Jesus now gives comfort. He talks about the present way to live. We're on mission. We're here for a purpose. But then he talks also about a future kingdom to come. And that is this harvest is coming. There is a coming harvest. Verses 39 through 43. It says, as the weeds are pulled up and burned in the fire. Remember, he's explaining now the parable. So it will be at the end of the age, the end of the age. The son of man, there it is again, will send out his angels and they will weed out of his kingdom everything that causes sin and all who do evil. They will throw them into the blazing furnace where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Then the righteous will shine like the sun in the kingdom of their father. Whoever has ears, let him hear. Now the harvest image is a powerful image. It's found throughout really the whole Bible. The harvest is an image of sowing and reaping, the harvest being the reaping time. The harvest is the idea that there's a return on an investment that's been made. As you've done this, so will this happen to you and for you. In this context, Jesus is talking about the harvest being judgment. Sometimes the harvest is a good thing. You will reap what you sow. That can be a good principle. In this sense, same way. They will reap, evildoers will reap what they have sown. The harvest is coming. There is judgment to come. Jesus is talking about the judgment of evil. And though now we see evil at work and we scratch our heads and we go, what's going on? We see it, we, we feel helpless sometimes. Jesus is reminding them, he's reminding you and me that there is going to come a day when things will be made right. And this rotten world will be set in place, that justice will roll like a river and that God will bring accountability to what is so rotten and evil in this world. There's a day coming when God is going to set things right. And this reconciliation that's going to occur is upon the advent of eternity. Jesus talked about it time and time again. Jesus talked about a heaven and he talked about a hell. Real places of eternal existence. That's what he's referring to here. Heaven being eternal life with God. Hell being eternal separation from God. The image, imagery here, the, the harvest coming, the judgment coming, and what happens after that judgment, the image is a blazing furnace. It just doesn't get more vivid than that. He's talking about eternal separation from God. He says it's going to be a place of weeping and gnashing of teeth, grinding of teeth. Again, images of Deep regret, deep pain, deep separation, deep lostness, a sense of how could I have been so stupid and for eternity, separation from God. Folks, it's real. And Jesus has left us here on this earth to be used by him to be stop gaps to help people avoid that place. That's why he has us here. That's part of our our mission. And he says there's this harvest coming. He says it's going to come at the end of the age. End of the age. This is important. It's not now, but a day is coming. And when Christ will return, that day of judgment will be among us and upon us. It's going to occur at the end of the age. It's important to understand that because I think the disciples wanted it to take place now. We look at the world, we say, man, God, cut loose. 
repay, punish, that kind of thing. And what we have to remember is that that judgment is God's job, not ours. This is not the age of judgment, folks. We live in the age of grace. There's coming a day when grace will be over and judgment will come. But for now, it is our job not to judge the world, but to love the world and to show grace to the world and to be people who share the gospel with the world so that those might avoid this place called hell. The disciples ask, you know, those, those uh, uh, workers ask the master, hey, do you want us to go and gather the weeds right now? What did the master say? No, not right now. Wait until the harvest. Imagine the disciples saying, can, we, can the sickle swing now? I mean, let it happen. We have days like that. It's not time. We must be patient We are not judge, jury, and executioner. That's not our job, folks. We are to love, show grace. We are to be as Jesus was. What did he do? He loved, he forgave, he gave grace. He laid down his life. And the reason that God is wanting us to be patient is because he is patient. 2 Peter 3, verse 9, the context Peter was writing to a group of people who were experiencing intense suffering. They were suffering for their faith. And Peter writes to them, and I can imagine them saying to themselves, when will the judgment of God come? When will it come? When will God rescue us? Peter says in 2 Peter 3, 9, the Lord is not slow in keeping his promise, as some understand slowness. God's got a timetable. Instead, he is patient with you, not wanting anyone to perish, but everyone to come to repentance. That is such great news. Thank God for his patience. Thank God that he was patient enough to wait on me. That judgment was delayed so that I could come to faith in Christ. This is what he wants for the world. And then Jesus would end this section. He would say, he who has ears to hear, let him hear. What does that mean? Jesus saying, listen up. Listen up. If you have ears, hear this. This is so important. He would say to those who would reject the Christ, to those who would reject Jesus, he would say, listen up. There is a harvest coming. But the Lord is patient. The Lord is waiting for you. Repent. Turn to him. The love of Christ, God stands ready to receive you and to forgive you if you repent to him and to those who were his disciples, to followers of Jesus like you and me, he would say, I know you look at this world and it seems like it's out of control. I know you look at this world and things seem very bleak and dark, but this reminds us that there is coming a kingdom, that a harvest is coming, And that God is still working. Though behind the scenes, though unseen, though it's bleak, it's dark, we can't see everything, God is still doing his kingdom work. And it's going to culminate one day at the second coming of our Lord Jesus Christ when he will set all things in their proper place. That should bring us hope. That should bring us comfort. My daughter was younger, really young. She was just learning to play hide-and-seek. She didn't quite get the concept. So I would say, you want to play hide-and-seek? Yeah, you know. She didn't quite really understand what it, what it meant. She saw her brothers do it. And so I said, okay, well, you, you go hide. I'm going to count. And she would, she would run around the house a little bit, and then she would sit in the middle of the room, in the middle of the room, not in a closet or anything, sit in the middle of the room and cover her eyes like this. <laughs> I was like, I don't think you're quite getting this concept. I was a little concerned about her mental faculties. You know, are you going to get this at some point? You know, eventually she got it. But she would sit in the middle of the room, she would cover her eyes, and she would think because she couldn't see me that I couldn't see her. That because I was hid from her or that she was hid from me in her sense that I was hid from her, but I could absolutely see her. I was watching her all along though she thought I couldn't see her. 
I, I think sometimes we think about God in that sense. We don't see God. We look around our world, there's a lack of clarity. Our eyes are veiled to the spiritual kingdom that's really at work. Our eyes are veiled to the kingdom that's going to come. And we can lose a perspective and we begin to think that because we can't see God, he doesn't see us. I want to remind you today that God is still on his throne. I can't tell you the kind of peace that brought to me this week. God is still on his throne. God is still in control. And he has a reason and a purpose for this day, for this age, for this dispensation. There is a reason for it. Thank God for that season, that reason. So he's being patient. He's waiting for all to come to repentance. But there's coming a day. That harvest is coming. And Jesus described that day like this. He said, then the righteous, listen to this beautiful language, then the righteous will shine like the sun in the kingdom of God of their father. What a beautiful, beautiful day that will be. Let us wait for, let us pray for that day. And in the meantime, let us accept the mission that God has for us, that we would be willing to be changed, that we would give up the expectation that life is going to be easy, that there's not going to be hardships in this world, that we're going to see evil and pain take place. It's going to happen. It's there. The evil is sowed throughout the earth as well. But in the midst of that, we will be changed and that we will be used to change other people to God's glory. Let's bow in prayer. Father, thank you for the sweet promises of Scripture. Thank you that through a story, a parable like this, we can be reminded that we are planted here purposefully, planted in our place, in our world. It's not by accident. But through your sovereignty and through your will, You've put us in a, in a place for a purpose. And I pray that we would cooperate with you in that purpose. There are people in this room that are facing great difficulties. They need comfort today. They need a perspective that you're in control. It seems like life is spiraling out of control. Thank you for the hope and for the promise. And so, God, help us to be people of faith. This is what it means to have faith. We don't see, yet we believe. Help us to trust, not only in your goodness, your love and your mercy that we see, but help us to also trust in your justice. Our job is not to judge job is not to bring punishment upon this world. Our job is to wait, to pray, to be used by you for the sake of others. So as Jesus was, help us to be. And encourage us, Father, this time that you've given us here on this earth. Remind us of present day comfort Remind us of the future hope of glory. We pray these things in Jesus' name.